Hey, uh, uh, this is Brian Damage from Kix. Well, I mean, it was this uh, kind of a, like a long, drawn-out process for us. It wasn't like a, an immediate bang like like some bands but uh i think for us it was more just um kind of bad timing we, we just we're never in the right place at the right time you know when we got signed it was really early on um before the metal thing kind of took off and um and even like uh you know we were signed to atlantic records which w w when we got signed we thought oh we finally made it but but actually it was the you know the very beginning and and uh, and Atlantic didn't even have a they didn't even have like a like a heavy metal hard rock section of the label so we were just thrown in with everybody Phil Collins and you know all those bands and and uh, it wasn't until Skid Row came along that they they actually made a kind of a a metal uh, department and so they didn't know what to do with us for one thing so we they just kind of threw us out there and and. Uh, I don't know, we just kind of kept going like we'd always been doing up till that point, just touring and touring and touring. And uh, so, yeah, that was, for us it was like that. We didn't have good, we didn't have the proper management, you know, and, and the record label, label didn't really know what to do with us. And, and uh, we were kind of on our own and just sort of learned as we went along. And, and we, we switched management at one point early on, like right after the first record, we, we hooked up with this guy, Bud Preger, that had Foreigner, who was also on Atlantic. So we thought, well, you know, he's well connected. This is, this is a good move. So we went with this, this guy. He didn't know what to do with this. You know, it's just like this weird, you know, so we floundered another couple of years. Then we switched again on our third record, um, to a guy named Pete Sully, or no, no, that's the guy that produced it. <laughs> uh, Alex, Alex Scott, this manager, he had the Stray Cats. And uh, we thought, well, the Stray Cats, at that point, the Stray Cats were huge. So we went with this guy. But the problem was he jumped onto the Stray Cats thing as they were already taken off. So he didn't really, he wasn't really responsible for them taking off. So when he got us, it was like he didn't know what to do with us. He didn't know how to get us up to that level. So there we were with him, just sort of floundering again for a couple more years. And uh, it wasn't until, until right before um, Blow My Fuse, we, we found this guy, uh, uh, Mark Puma, who had uh, Twisted Sister. And Mark was the first guy and manager that we finally found that had a plan, knew what to do. He had Twisted Sister. and. Um, and he was also well well connected to Atlantic and he was like an expert at work in the record company. And so that that's I think that explains why Blow My Fuse did so well and, and our career kind of took a leap at that point. Um, but everybody knows what happened right after that. You know, we thought, you know, Blow My Fuse was like our, our peak and then uh, we uh, recorded Hotwire, which I felt was a better record, like an even better record. And, and we thought, you know, Don't Close Your Eyes was this hit. Now, now we're like right on the verge here. So we throw, uh, put Hotwire out. And the week it was being released, we had a meeting with the, the label president and he opens that door and pulls out that Nirvana CD. But we still felt it was a good record and we went out and, you know, played behind it. But, it, you know, we could see the ship was starting to sink and, and if, you know, we could feel it going down. And, and, uh, and that's actually when I jumped ship right after that. I was in uh, early 93. I just... Where'd you go? I left the East Coast and moved out to L.A. and, and left the band. And, and uh, there's a lot of reasons behind that other than just the record label and the the scene <laughs> but uh, at that point there were so many things within the band I was feeling like just frustrated and and that didn't add to it the fact that I felt it sinking and it was like I'd gone through uh, whatever how many years that is 13 maybe years at that point and climb just climbing 
to get to that point. And then it starts dropping and I'm just like, you know, I need a break. <laughs> so I, I left and, and uh, you know, the funny thing was uh, financial wise, I had enough money to last like two weeks. I was in several bands. All through the 90s, I just kind of rotated in and out of bands. And Anything notable or? Not really. I no. did like a blues band. I, I, did, I played with people. Like I played uh, the, the band that I left Kicks for <laughs> was, uh, was a band that had um, the drummer from Junkyard, Pat, and uh, Eric Stacy from Faster Pussycat was in that band, and uh, a couple other guys that um, were unknowns. But this singer that was really good, um, it had kind of like this Paul Rogers, Chris Robinson kind of a vibe to it and, and uh, played with them for a couple years but then that thing fell apart and uh, played in a blues band and I then I hooked up with, uh, in the blues band, the bass player from Rhino Bucket was playing bass and that's how him and I got together and then later on we hooked up with George the singer and it wasn't quite Rhino Bucket yet but that ended up morphing into Rhino Bucket, back into Rhino Bucket in, in um, I think 2000 or somewhere around there, 1999 or 2000. So I was playing with those guys and uh, and I was still working. I, I finished the, oh, you know, another, another part of my story <laughs> were, the, were the drugs. That's what happened during the 90s for me. It was like, Phew! and um, I ended up getting sober in 98. I went through jail and rehab, that whole thing, which kind of turned my life around. So then uh, by the time, around 2003, um, I talked to Steve for the first time in like 10 years. And he, he was doing his funny money thing and Ronnie had his blues vultures thing on the East Coast and they would do shows together and at the end of the night, Ronnie would jump up with Steve's band and they would do kicks songs and the crowd would go crazy. And, and then the club owners started giving them little bonuses for doing that. And so Steve called me and he goes, hey, you know, we've been doing this. It would be cool for you to like just fly in and do this surprise jump up on stage and it would be almost like a kicks reunion thing. And uh, so I said, yeah, that sounds like it would be kind of cool. And it, for some reason, that, that didn't work out, that, that version of it, because um, they wanted to know, they needed to know how much it would take to get me there. And, and they were only going to throw like a $100 bonus for that. And I'm like, that, you know, I'm not going to fly across the country for 100 bucks. So, so, so then Steve and I f talked about it further, and we thought, well, you know, if we're going to do it, why don't we really do it and really put the band back together and, and see how it goes. And, and, so that's, that was how we sort of fell back into it. Because once we did that and we played Baltimore and we saw the reaction, it was like, we got to do this again. So it started out just like that around Baltimore. And then from there, it, it just, we, we just thought it was a whim. And we thought, you know, we'll do a few shows and have fun and get paid. And, and it was such a good turnout that we saw, thought we'd book another group of shows. And we started doing that like, once or twice a year we'd do a little group of shows and it kept growing and I finally talked Steve into letting me talk to a booking agent which uh, that really opened it up so so uh, you know our first huge out-of-town show was Rocklahoma in 2008 and uh, you know the rest is history I mean it's just it just keeps going mm -hmm.